Might join task force Operation Inherent Resolve. Sir, we'll open it up to you for an opening statement and uh, proceed to questions. Over to you, sir. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Pentagon Press Corps. Good to see everybody again. I've got a quick opening statement covering major ongoing operations, and I'll be glad to take your questions. First, on behalf of the coalition, I would like to offer our condolences to the families and loved ones of those killed and injured in the bombing of Karada District in Baghdad on Monday. This attack against families celebrating an Eid feast after their daily Ramadan fasting is yet another example of just how horrible Daesh is and why we must defeat these monsters here and now. We stand with the peoples of Iraq and Syria and are resolved to defeat Daesh and deliberate both countries from this gang of thugs and murderers that have killed and injured so many. So if we could bring up the map, uh, I'll reference that throughout, as we usually do. Uh, in Fallujah, Iraqi security forces are still transitioning the control of the liberated city from the Army, Federal Police, and the Counterterrorism Service inside the city to the Hold Force, which will be a combination of police and Anbari tribal fighters enrolled in the Popular Mobilization Program. The Iraqi chain of command has also reported that the pocket of Daesh fighters to the southwest that the 8th Iraqi Army Division were fighting has been cleared. Elements of five Iraqi Army divisions are continuing security operations in the suburbs around Fallujah. The transition to the hold force is ongoing, and it is on an Iraqi timeline. But a few units have already moved from Fallujah to other locations. The last coalition strike into Fallujah in support of the forces clearing the city was on June 29th. In northern Iraq, shaping operations and preparation for the eventual liberation of Mosul continue. Iraqi security forces continue to maneuvering towards Kiara, which is star two on the map. As we've discussed before, the attack towards Kiara along two axes continues. Along the eastern axis, the brigades of the 15th Iraqi Army Division continue to clear dash pockets from the small villages to the southeast of Kiara. The 72nd Brigade continues to hold Karabit Jabbar and clear Haj Ali. Nineveh police battalions are assuming the hold force mission in the cleared towns of Kabruk, Mahana, and Karbadan. In the last 24 hours, the CJTF has conducted two strikes in support of these forces, destroying a vehicle, a rocket system, and a mortar system. On the western axis, the 9th Iraqi Army Division, supported by counterterrorism service forces, continued to attack north towards Kiara from Beji. We have seen tactical repositioning from the forward elements due to enemy activity along the forward edge of their formation. But once again, we've seen everyone reoccupy their most forward positions south of the town of Ramadaniat. The forces on this axis recently completed the clearing of the town of Makul. Resistance along the western axis has remained light to moderate, with Dash using the tactics that we have seen before. Earthworks, obstacle belts, indirect fire, and suicide attacks. In the last week, the coalition has conducted 11 strikes in the Kiara region in support of these operations. I'd like to reiterate the importance of Kiara and the major towns in this area, such as Sharkat. Not only do we want to clear Kiara because Daesh controls it, but Kiara is also important because it is approximately 50 kilometers from Mosul. This intermediate step on the way to Mosul, just as we saw at Makmur, will allow the Iraqi security forces to posture for the eventual big fight to liberate Mosul. Continuing on to Syria, Star 3, in Manbij, the operation by the Syrian Democratic Forces, led on this attack by the Syrian Arab Coalition, continues the isolation of Manbij and the fight to seize a firm foothold in the city. The fighting remains tough and the resistance stiff against our partnered forces. Daesh has attempted to counterattack both the inner cordon around the city and the outer cordon of the isolation force on the north and south sides of that force. The SDF has repeatedly defeated Daesh's attempts to punch a hole through the cordon. Dash continues to use indirect fire and vehicle-borne IEDs, VBIDs, in attempts to disrupt the attack. In the last 48 hours, the coalition has destroyed three VBIDs attempting to attack the SDF. Since operations began on May 21st, the Syrian Arab coalition has gained more than 1,000 kilometers and has been supported by more than 325 coalition strikes. Farther west on the Mara Line, Star 4, the vetted Syrian opposition, or VSO, and the affiliated moderate Syrian opposition, or MSO, have seized multiple villages from Daesh on the northern edge of that line. We have seen towns traded back and forth between the VSO, MSO, and Daesh multiple times over the last nine months. 
But we've seen rapid advances against Daesh held villages of Tal Batal Shamiel, Mazra At Shaheen, Kisa Jik, and Tal Amar. We've seen Daesh fighters leaving these previously defended towns to attempt to reinforce Manbij. As the pressure increases against Daesh and Manbij, they are demonstrating more desperation to keep that strategic crossroads open for access outside Syria. And as our partner forces continue to apply pressure to Daesh across Iraq and Syria, we also continue to pressure Daesh functionally as well. Operation Tidal Wave 2 continues to reduce Daesh's access to revenues from illicit oil and natural gas operations. I want to clarify a point from last week. I mentioned that our estimate, uh, in our estimate, Daesh is earning $300 million a month from illicit oil activities. That should have been approximately $30 million a month. And we estimate that the reduction from Tidal Wave 2 operations cuts their revenues by a half to approximately $15 million a month. Since September 2014, CJTF has conducted 303 strikes against oil and gas-related facilities. Since the start of Operation Tidal Wave 2, we've conducted 193 of those strikes. The last was on the 4th of July against six oil well heads. Now, this completes my prepared comments. I'll be glad to take your questions. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can give us an update of the fighting around Raqqa. Uh, what, if any, continued Russian activity have you seen there, if any, um, or are you seeing any evidence of this ceasefire we've been hearing about? And can you tell us how close any of the Syrian opposition forces are getting to Raqqa and whether there are any U.S. Um, either advisors or enablers with them? Okay, uh, uh, first I'll tell you, and you guys have heard me say it before, but I, I'm not going to make myself a spokesperson for the Russian forces. Um, um, I, I know that the Syrian government announced that 72-hour uh, ceasefire, and uh, as we've mentioned before, uh, CJTF does not have a role in that, uh, no, neither in enforcement uh, nor in uh, monitoring. Uh, we are here to fight Daesh, and we are continuing to do that. Uh, that being said, uh, we want to see the conflict uh, uh, stop so a political solution can take place. Uh, but, but in terms of the Syrian ceasefire, I don't have anything additional to offer you uh, at this time. The, uh, in terms of where our forces are that we are partnered with on the ground, we are focused in uh, near Manbij. That's where the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, our focus is around Manbij. We've got the forces over on the Mara line that we are partnered with, and then we've got the forces down uh, at, at uh, Antanf, um, the garrison forces there uh, that, that we are partnered with as well. So, so those are where our forces are on the battlefield. Uh, our forces aren't uh, close to impacting anywhere near where the Syrian uh, regime or the Russian forces are operating. And are they, but are the Syrian forces getting any, making any progress toward Raqqa at this point? I, I haven't seen anything that shows that they had uh, made any additional progress. I mean, we saw uh, a, like a, a Russian and Syrian column that kind of moved up toward uh, the air base. There was an air base to the south, uh, and the name is escaping me right now. Uh, that force had withdrawn back into its uh, forward lines uh, after it had been attacked by Daesh. That was about two weeks ago. Uh, we have not seen uh, Russian or Syrian forces moving towards uh, Raqqa in that direction since then. Thank you. Hi, Hi Chris. This is Ming Nan. Uh, I have a question that uh, there are people who are saying that ISIS is the brainchild of the U.S. policy in the Middle East. And then today there's this British report uh, on, on the Iraq war. It just newly published it and says basically it's not necessary to start the war and the war is not legitimate. Do you think you are cleaning up a mess of a mistake right now in you know, dealing with ISIS? Uh, I think we are conducting operations against a pretty horrible group of people uh, that have declared themselves independent of the world system 
stolen terrain from two different countries, declared themselves a caliphate, uh, which of course also has you know, the uh, Islamic religious uh, implications as well. And then they started murdering people and executing people, and they put it all up on YouTube. So I, I'm personally not, I don't really care where they came from. I know that they're here now. Uh, we saw the results of what they do on Monday in Baghdad. Uh, we see the results every time. You think you can't see anything else from, from ISIS. Uh, they show you something new and horrible on YouTube. Uh, so I, I don't want to get into a debate of where they came from. Uh, we know, you know that there are roots back to Al-Qaeda. We know that there are roots uh, back farther than that. And the history of the, the uh, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom uh, is well known, and, and, and I don't need to get into that debate. Uh, what, I, what I do know is uh, that they are the force in front of us now. They are the force that's conducting attacks like we saw in Paris, like we saw in Brussels. Uh, they are inspiring attacks like we saw in San Bernardino and we saw in uh, Orlando. And this is a force that needs to be dealt with. Uh, these, are, these are people that they need to not only be defeated on the battlefield, but their ideology needs to be uh, broken and defeated as well. So that's kind of how I look at this in terms of, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not really worried about where they came from. I understand there's lots of debate about that, um, and, and I understand people's interest in it, but what we're focused on is where we are right now, and where we are right now is we're heading toward Mosul, we're operating around Manvidge, and we're continuing to keep pressure on Daesh all across the breadth and depth of their formations. Hi, Chris. Uh, I have... Um, uh, one housekeeping question. Have, um, have U.S. troops begun partnering at the brigade or battalion, at the battalion level, as Secretary Carter announced in April they would begin doing in Iraq? Yeah, right. I mean, we know that that was, that was authorized and discussed. You've heard the Secretary of Defense talk about that, and you've heard the President talk about that. We have not started doing that at this time. Uh, that will be done in conjunction with and in discussion with the Iraqi forces, of course. They'll approve uh, that, that move if we do that. So we haven't done that yet at this time, but it is an option available to us. And if General McFarland feels that it would, in fact, accelerate a part of the campaign, uh, then we would discuss that with the Iraqis and look to implement that. I just wanted to make sure that, that we weren't missing that. Uh, next on Kiara, um, you, you equated it to Mach Moore. I'm wondering if, are, is there any um, sort of forward U.S. presence in Kiara right now, like we saw in Mach Moore, um, with the Iraqis, any kind of like a, a forward base? Uh, yeah, no, uh, they're not to Kiara. Uh, they're not to Kiara yet. So we expect there to be an attack to seize the city. Uh, we expect them to clear all of that. Then they'll start to build out that base, like we saw with Mockmore, uh, when it was in a position where you would put a headquarters. Uh, that's where we would assume uh, that coalition forces may go into that point. So Kiara is still in enemy control right now. Uh, the forces are moving on their way. The advice and assist that we are providing uh, to those forces is as we have been doing it in the past, uh, which is back from the front lines at the headquarters. Uh, and then I have one sort of one bigger, bigger picture question. Um, uh, there's been more talk recently about uh, the, the pressure on ISIS in Iraq and Syria is causing them to branch out more into other places in the world. In the past two weeks or so, we've seen terrible terrorist attacks that were either ISIS-directed or more often ISIS-inspired um, in the West. And I'm wondering what the, the military analysis of, the, of that is from your vantage point, from the, the, the military leaders who you deal with every day. Do they agree with that? Do they believe that the pressure in Iraq and Syria is causing them to either send fighters out or encourage more attacks around the world? Do you, is there a correlation? No, that's a great question. I know there's a lot of interest in that, and clearly we, we look at that as well. Uh, what I can say is, while there may be some correlation, uh, what Daesh has demonstrated is the willingness to conduct attacks on us no matter what's happening to them inside Iraq and Syria. Uh, the attacks that are, take place 
are, are not something that just happened quickly. There's clearly, there's planning and time that go into that. Uh, clearly, they have stated, as they did uh, going into Ramadan, they are encouraging everyone who follows them around the world to rise up and c conduct attacks. And, and uh, uh, they wanted Ramadan to be a bloody month uh, from beginning to end. Uh, and unfortunately, we saw at the end, uh, uh, they were able to, to conduct some horrific attacks. So is there a correlation in the pressure uh, to what we see around? I, I think there's some, uh, because when you see that pressure, what we've seen Dash say is, we've seen them say, don't come to Syria, don't come to Iraq, uh, go elsewhere and, and try to join Dash, go elsewhere and, and, and cause havoc if you can. Um, so that, that pressure clearly is having an effect on what they're doing here. Uh, but how much of it impacts directly on the forces that they're sending out or they're inspiring attacks or trying to finance attacks on the outside? Uh, I, I can't tell you specifically, but they want to do that anyway. I mean, I, whether we were attacking them or not, they would look to incite attacks uh, across the globe. And so uh, I think that you still have to beat them here. Clearly, that's why we're here is we still have to beat them. We still have to break the caliphate. We still have to show that they are not worth following from the worst of humanity around the globe. Uh, but uh, they would want to do that in our capitals anyway. They would want to do that in the Western countries anyway. Thank you. Next to Richard Fitz. Yeah, hi, Colonel. Uh, can you comment or confirm in any way uh, reports from the um, United Nations, the uh, High Commissioner for Refugees in Baghdad, of um, some 900 uh, refugees from Fallujah uh, being picked up by the PMF uh, in an area west of uh, Fallujah and uh, being isolated, and some reports of up to 50 summary executions. Have you heard anything about that, Colonel? Uh, we've seen some uh, open source reporting on that. Uh, we haven't seen uh, continued open source reporting on several of the stories, but clearly it's something we're, we're you know, we've been talking about this for several weeks. Uh, it, it's something that, that we're concerned about. Uh, the Iraqi government continues its investigations into uh, the initial allegations as well. Uh, I don't, I know that the Iraqi forces separated uh, military aged males that potentially were DASH members uh, when they cleared Fallujah, and some of that screening is still going on. Uh, whether those 900 are, are, are part of uh, the 900 you're discussing, or whether there's, there's a correlation between that, I, I don't know. And, and we're not you know, involved in detention operations here. That is, the Iraqi government uh, is conducting those operations, the detention operations. So we're concerned about it. Uh, it continues to be a topic that we train the lowest soldiers with when it comes to the law of armed conflict. It continues to be a topic at the, the, the key leader engagement at the senior level. Uh, my, my generals talk to ministerial level and Iraqi leaders uh, about that, uh, but I don't have anything specific on those 900 that, that we'd seen in the press or uh, you know, other reports that we've seen uh, along the way. Colonel, uh, could I follow up, please? Um in Baghdad itself, and you referenced the, uh, the horrific attack in Karada a couple of days ago. Um, do you expect or are there discussions underway uh, between the U.S. And the, and the Iraqis of uh, ways to uh, uh, bolster security in Baghdad? And might this have an effect, uh, are you concerned that this might have an effect on uh, perhaps the Iraqis um, uh, slowing down what they're doing up north and going towards Mosul to, uh, to try to secure their capital. All right, two parts. Uh, I'll try to deal with them uh, uh, in order. Uh, the first question uh, regarding are we talking to the Iraqis about security in their capital? Absolutely. Uh, and we are providing assistance, and we're also providing intelligence sharing uh, when it comes to the, the, the bombers who are trying to attack Baghdad. Uh, and there is some technological support that I won't get into the specifics of, uh, but we are providing them intelligence uh, to, bolster their, uh, to bolster their efforts, to bolster their ability to control uh, the capital. 
But the control of the Iraqi capital is definitely, it is an Iraqi chain of command issue. It is an Iraqi government, uh, Iraqi military, Iraqi security forces uh, issue. So we're, we're providing advice. Certainly we're talking about it, uh, but they're in the lead. And, uh, and then we're providing them some intelligence, uh, looking specifically for the bombers attacking Baghdad, uh, looking to how we can influence those bombers and stop them before they uh, conduct an attack. And there's, like I said, some other support that's going on that I can't discuss the specifics of. Uh, second question is, uh, are, they, are they looking at uh, you know, reorganizing their forces and uh, coming back to Baghdad? W we're concerned about that. Uh, and certainly the prime minister is, you know, looking at the security situation in Baghdad very carefully. But we still see the Iraqi security forces uh, up in uh, the Tigris River Valley conducting that attack. And they're still moving forward. And as a matter of fact, uh, they're still out uh, clearing uh, cities on the eastern axis. They're still finalizing the bat clearing uh, of Haj Ali today. Uh, so those forces continue to move up and continue to be focused. And we think... Uh, the coalition believes that Mosul is the prize and continuing to break the caliphate and continuing to break the will of Daesh inside uh, is the right course of action. Uh, we, we think Daesh wants the Iraqis to turn around and stop the attack and go back to Baghdad. And so clearly you don't want to do what the enemy wants you to do. You want to keep moving and you want to keep attacking and you want to keep that pressure up. Uh, as we've gotten to all of this uh, momentum and pressure on the side of the Iraqi security forces, you know, we don't want to see that uh, turned away. Uh, and there are, you know, like I said, the, 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 the Prime Minister, clearly he's concerned about this, uh, but we haven't seen any changes yet. We've seen the Iraqi army still pushing forward toward Mosul. Next to Carlos and Bubba. Hey, Carlos. Uh, I just want to follow up on um, Rich's comment about the uh, security situation in Baghdad. With the Karada bombings taking place probably like a week after uh, Iraqi officials said uh, Fallujah had been cleared, do you think now that the, the level, the intensity of that bombing, the, the casualty numbers that are going up, do you think that attack sort of takes away from the Iraqi argument that Fallujah needed to be sort of bumped up in the order of uh, cities that were sort of retaken from ISIS because of the security threat? I mean, now that it's been recaptured, you have the Karada bombings a couple days later. So I kind of want to get your thoughts on that. Uh, okay, I, I understand the question. Um, I'm not sure that I, I'm uh, not sure that I see the correlation that uh, after Fallujah was taken, the bombing happened, therefore Fallujah was a bad idea. We defeated Daesh in Fallujah, and Fallujah was the main town on the Euphrates River Valley coming into Baghdad. Defeating them there and clearing them out, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, clearly, some of the Iraqi officials had stated that they hoped clearing Fallujah would stop the attacks. Uh, there's still bombers out there, and we're still trying to get to them, and we're still trying to stop them. But the easy access up and down the Euphrates River Valley has been taken away, uh, and a an entire city which you can dive in and hide after you've conducted an attack, uh, if it's not a suicide attack, then that's been taken away. Uh, and so, you know, the Prime Minister, I think, said a couple days ago that uh, he felt Daesh conducted that attack to try to take away from the Iraqi security forces victory in, in, in uh, Fallujah. Now, but you would have had to clear Fallujah anyway. Uh, you have an enemy city 30 miles from your, from your capital. Uh, there's no good that comes of that. And we saw the Iraqi security forces had the capability to conduct operations both in the Euphrates River Valley and in the Tigris River Valley at the same time. So I don't see anything that would cause me to say, well, this happened because of that. I think the timing is what it is. I also think that uh, the timing of Ramadan is the significant timing here, is that Daesh wanted to try to conduct spectacular attacks inside Ramadan to prove it is still relevant and to show that it is still a force to be feared because they know they're losing on the battlefield. And we've even seen in their propaganda materials a change in attitude uh, that is they're no longer the 10-foot-tall invincible force. Uh, so I think they're trying to regain momentum themselves by conducting asymmetrical attacks. Since they can't beat in a symmetrical fight, 
in a conventional fight, they can't beat the Iraqi security forces on the battlefield right now. That's, I think, why the timing is the way it is. Uh, I, I don't have a ton of evidence to lay out for you to explain that, but you know, we saw Dash talk about Ramadan as the time to conduct the attack. Uh, we don't think that it was tied to Fallujah. We think it was tied to Ramadan. And, uh, Colonel, just a quick follow-up question uh, regarding the Iraqi security forces um, that are being that are heading elsewhere out of Fallujah during this transition period. Where are they heading? Are the majority of those heading into Mosul? Are some being redeployed back into Baghdad to maintain security for the capital? Are any of them being sent to cities like Keet or Rutba? There have been reports that uh, ISIS have sort of launched little have been engaged in some skirmishes with um, the holding forces in those cities in uh, in Anbar. Uh, it's a good question and and we've seen a couple units head back to Baghdad and I don't want to talk about the specifics of where others have gone and and th that process is just starting sending all those Iraqi army units uh, out to their next mission uh, that that's just just starting uh, as for the skirmishes in uh, the Anbar province. Uh, we still see Daesh uh, around the town of Zangara. Uh, we still see Daesh sort of to the north of the Euphrates, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of Ramadi, some up near Heat. And the Iraqi security forces are continuing those, those clearing operations. But those aren't skirmishes. Those are the defensive fights for Daesh because the Iraqi security forces are still in there trying to clear those forces out. So they are conducting attacks and Daesh is responding to those attacks. Uh, they're not big attacks because the, the, the bulk of forces clearly was in Ram uh, Fallujah. Clearly there's a bulk of forces heading up to the, uh, towards Kiara. Uh, but those forces are not just the hold force inside the rest of the Anbar province and inside the rest of the, uh, the Euphrates, excuse me, Euphrates River Valley. Those forces are fighting and clearing and attacking to clear Daesh out of those pockets. Oh, sure. Colonel Garber Barber, just a couple of very quick questions, if I may. First, on Karada, what two things? What evidence do you see of the possibility ISIS used some type of incendiary explosives in Karada, despite the fact it was crowded, despite the fact there was incendiary material in these buildings? Quite an extraordinary amount of damage. ISIS claims it has incendiary explosive material. Do you have evidence of that? And on Karada. Are you also saying that you are hunting the bombers and their network? Uh, first, I am not sure if there's any um, uh, any any uh, corroboration, collaboration between uh, the the coalition and the Iraqi security security force on the investigation at Karada. I believe that's an Iraqi security force issue, and they're conducting that investigation. I mean, we'll clearly take a look at the, you know, the evidence that we see as well, uh, but, I, but I don't think we're in the forensic lead. And if you remember, uh, you know, back in the, in, uh, the last time we were here in, in Iraq, uh, we developed forensic capability for them, trained them and built facilities to teach them forensic capability to be able to specifically learn about uh, bomb makers. And so that, that capability exists within the Iraqi security force apparatus. Uh, so I don't think we're connected to that, but I will go back and check, and if we are, I'll get back to you and let you know on that. Uh, in terms of, I'm sorry, what was your second question? And I have a bunch of questions. Just quickly, do you have any evidence that ISIS has incendiary, incendiary explosives? Have you ever learned that they do in any of your raids, any material, any intelligence gathered? Do they have incendiary explosives? Uh, I'm not in a position to tell you they do or they don't right now. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. So like I said, I'll go back and, and ask about that. But that wasn't the second question. What was the other one? In the bomber network, you seem to indicate that you were, the one for Karada. We are supporting the Iraqis who are going after the bomber network. That is correct. Uh, we're supporting them with intelligence and uh, some technological capability. but. Uh, but I don't want—I can't talk the specifics of it. But we are indeed supporting their fight against that bomber network. The one for Karada. But if that was a question, I missed the first half. If you can say it again. Are you referencing that you are specifically supporting the Iraqis' effort to find 
specifically the bomber network that did the Karada bombing. Is that what you're saying? No, I am saying we are providing them support towards identifying the bomber networks uh, in general. Uh, if that network is part of this, then and then the Iraqis are hunting that network, which I, which I assume they are right now, we're providing support to that. What is the latest that attack? I mean, we were providing this support to their. We are providing that support uh, to the to the Iraqi government before that attack. What is the latest on Abu Kamal? Were there ever, your coalition spokesman, were there coalition forces involved before, during, or after Abu Kamal? Once the forces you supported left, did you bomb the site so ISIS couldn't get its hands on the equipment? Did you bring in troops? Did you have advisors there? Were there any coalition forces at Abu Kamal? Yeah, the answer is no. Uh, that was not an, a, an that was not an a, an, an accompanied mission. Uh, clearly, we were involved in the planning, we were involved in the preparation, but there were no coalition advisors uh, on the site. Um, we conducted airstrikes in preparation of the attack. I think I talked about that last week. Um, and then I don't want to talk specifics of, of kind of what happened to the force when it left. Um, and as I said earlier, parts of that operation are still ongoing. Uh, but we did not have coalition forces uh, on the ground uh, in Abu Kamal. I wouldn't talk about coalition soft operations anyway, but there were no coalition, no coalition soft on the ground, no advisors on the ground in Abu Kamal airstrikes afterwards to destroy the equipment they had to leave behind? Well, I think we saw some social media um, at, uh, indication that some of that equipment fell into Dash's hands. Um, and so uh, if, there, if there were airstrikes afterwards, uh, we clearly didn't get everything because we saw Dash displaying uh, equipment that had been left behind by the New Syrian Army uh, as it uh, pulled out of the area. Uh, hey, Chris, so just a quick follow on Kiara on the southern approaches to Mosul. Um, to, to, uh, to what extent is ISIS defending that area, since, as you pointed out, it's, it's uh, strategically important? And, and also, what is the level of activity currently ongoing? In other words, has that operation, the Iraqi operation, to take that town already uh, started, or is it still in a sort of shaping operations phase? Uh, in terms of uh, enemy activity around the area, I mean, we haven't gotten to Kiara yet. Uh, we're still pushing on the two axes to get to Kiara. And so as they approach, you see sort of belts of defense. And around little towns uh, is where you'll run into a belt of defense. And you'll see uh, earthworks built, trenches and, and berms. Uh, you'll see IEDs, as we've seen all through this fight, uh, used as mines. Uh, you'll see tied in with indirect fire and with, uh, uh, with machine guns, you know, what we'd consider kind of like a heavy defense or a moderate to heavy resistance. But that's not the whole way. They'll clear a town, and then they move forward. And so it's been clearing forward uh, as they move, especially the, the, the force from uh, Beji, which is moving from south to north, uh, up MSR, you know, up the, up the main uh, avenue of approach into Kiara. Uh, as they do that, uh, they're clearing those towns out and moving forward. As any force knows, when you're moving, there are times where you stop, consolidate, you reorganize, and you prep for your next attack. Uh, it's not just a step on the gas pedal and drive until you bump into something. So we see that going on as well. But the forces are still attacking. The, the force is still moving forward. Uh, they've gained, I believe, about uh, 75, 60, 75 kilometers is the estimate somewhere in there uh, from, when, from where they started uh, around Beji. And uh, they're continuing. That, the attack is still moving north, still pushing forward. 
Chris, it's Lita. Just a, a quick um, follow up, just a clarification on uh, the question that Courtney had. Um, the forces, the U.S. forces that were at what we called Firebase Bell, um, are they still there around Mark Moore? Because um, you likened Kiara sort of to Mark Moore, and I wanted to just make sure I understood this correctly. Are the forces there still at sort of Firebase Bell, Mark Moore, or have they moved along at all with the Iraqi forces, as you, you sort of suggested that they may be doing as they get towards Kiara? Uh, yeah, we, 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 we changed the name of that uh, to um, uh, Kiarasor uh, Complex was, the, was what we called that. Uh, in that area uh, around Bell and, and uh, uh, in around Mockmore. Those forces are still there. Uh, we have uh, artillery forces there providing support and shooting missions in support of the Iraqi movement. Uh, and I, as I know I've kind of mentioned before, uh, anytime you can have the stationary force artillery shooting for the moving force, that's a good thing. Your shots are more accurate because you're stationary. You've, you've had the proper time to what we call lay in the guns, which is uh, position them accurately so you know exactly where you are. Uh, you've got a better chance of, uh, of being accurate in your initial shots. And you're using your ammo, and you're allowing the moving force, the attacking force, to preserve their ammo. So anytime you can continue to do that, that's, that's a good thing. So we are providing uh, that support for them still. If the Iraqis were to reach a place where they wanted to establish something like Mahmoud, I mean, clearly that's a hypothetical question. Uh, we see them moving toward Kiara, uh, and, we, we, and as I've said before, I'm not quite sure what the next leapfrog is. Uh, but is there a possibility, is that a potential that we can move those guns forward? Well, uh, we could do that, absolutely. I wouldn't talk about it specifically, uh, but that is certainly uh, a possibility that we could. Lou Martinez. Hey, Chris, uh, Louis with ABC. Uh, question about Abu Kalab, uh, Kamal. Uh, what exactly happened there? Last week you were talking about how this was an operation to cut off the line of communication there in the south and, and that the uh, new Syrian army was pressing forward. And very quickly it sounded like they had to retreat back. Uh, how would you characterize what happened there? Was it a tactical retreat? Uh, was it an overwhelming defeat? I mean, what, what actually happened there? Because there was conflicting information about it. Well, I'll tell you, it's not an overwhelming defeat because the new Syrian army is still in the fight. Uh, they're still partnered with us. Uh, we're still providing them support. And whenever they go conduct another operation, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to let you know. Um, Abu Kamal is an important area, as is Al Qaim, as, we, as I talked about last week. Uh, that's a place where Daesh had never been attacked on the ground before. Uh, and now they have been attacked uh, on the ground. And that operation, frankly, was very confusing for them. And we see movement right now. Uh, I don't want to talk specifics because we don't necessarily want to let the enemy know what we know about him. Uh, but we see the enemy reacting still today to that attack. And, uh, it, you know, yes, the forces uh, at Abu Kamal, they took some, some casualties. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but that force performed under fire, and it is still in the fight today. And if I could just follow up, the name for this group is the New Syrian Army. Was, these, was this the same group that was trained during the first half of the train and equip um, mission? Yeah, some of them were. Some of those, some of those troops that were trained are in that group. Not everybody, but some of them were. Sir, I think we're out of questions. Do you have any uh, closing remarks you'd like to make? No, uh, just to say uh, thanks, everybody. Um, if you're trying to get a hold of me, I'm traveling tomorrow. I'll be back up in Baghdad after that. Uh, so next week should be from Baghdad. I think uh, I may bump into some of you along the way. Uh, it would be good to see everybody again. But uh, thanks, and uh, if you got any questions, don't uh, hesitate to send them our way. Thank you very much.